ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Shofar Call. I know the last few weeks uh, we have progressed from the topic of false prophets and being aware of them. Nevertheless, I thought it would be good to have a reiteration based on that. Beware of false prophets. The verse reads, show a statement as such. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. What is sheep's clothing? What are sheep clothed with? Fur with wool. Now let's dissect that a bit. What is a sheep's greatest and unending intent of use? A sheep is rarely reared for its meat. Perhaps it is used for temple sacrifices. But most effectively, sheep are always reared for their expensive wool. Sheep needs to be sheared or it will effectively lead to a severe breathing problem for the sheep and infectious disease as well. With that, we can establish that a sheep's major purpose is to provide clothing, fur, wool. In the years before industrial fibers, sheep wool was the major source of warm wear. Knowing this, what can we glean from the statement, false prophets coming in sheep's clothing? We know that they will be in the business of providing clothing. Now, clothing as a concept was initiated not for the purposes of fashion or style or even for the climate, but necessarily to cover the nakedness of man's ineptness or man's insufficiencies, which is why God himself made cloaks for Adam and Eve. Thereby, God was the first official designer of clothing. By simple extrapolation, a false prophet is one who seeks to clothe or make sufficient or make perfect anybody, any place or anything via ungodly ways. Most New Age and pantheistic faiths believe in most of the fundamental issues, the issues of right and wrong, ethics, morality, values. They probably even believe in justice. But the way they seek escape is within the self or within the person. And where we draw the line as Christians is to look nowhere except in the personhood of Yeshua. By that definition, most current day Christian teachers are not false prophets. I'll say that again. By that definition, most current day Christian teachers are not false prophets. A perfect example of false prophets would be the examples of Prophet, prophet Balaam who was aware of the true God, yet for own personal gain, provided ways and loopholes to deceive and connive the chosen people. Now that is a trait or a fruit of a false prophet. Other examples were the Nicolaitans and those who accepted the Jezebel spirit. Now notice the words used in the book of Revelation regarding these. The words used is seducing spirits. Ergo, anything that seduces us from our Redeemer, no matter how effective or how quaint, is a seducing spirit and is of a false prophet. Just as a true prophet is a representative of the one true God, false prophets are representatives of the false deities, that is the enemy. So what about wolves? A wolf always attacks individuals. A wolf will always corner its prey. A wolf will always go for the weakest of its prey. A wolf's goal is always to steal and to kill. I hope that sums some of the examples of what a wolf would do and what a false prophet would do. Now, coming to this newfound desire by anxious Christians to label and libel fellow believers, we ought to take an excerpt from the life of Yeshua. When we read in Luke chapter 7, when John the Baptist was in prison and when his life was in the balance, he sent his disciples to ask Yeshua up front if he was the Messiah they were expecting or if there was someone else they needed to wait for. This John the Baptist is the very same person who said it was his life's mission to herald the Messiah and he did so publicly. 
Yet his faith wavered, and his questions or probably his theology suffered a minor relapse. But nowhere is it said that Yeshua redacted his statement that those born of, of those born of woman, that John the Baptist was the greatest. Yeshua never redacted his statement, neither did he change it. Neither does Yeshua say, Lo, behold, John the Baptist, a false prophet or a false teacher. And likewise, Yeshua does the same when Peter denied him three times. Yeshua did not accuse him either. Now here is the interesting part. False teachings and false prophets are not the same thing. False teachings could be a byproduct of inaccurate doctrines. In most of Paul's letters to the churches, Paul addresses false teachings and the corrections for them. False teachings such as considering certain days more holy than others or regarding food sacrificed to the gods or teachings on circumcisions, etc. Paul constantly worked towards safeguarding the churches from false teachings. The following verse in Matthew 7 explains it best. The words Yeshua used to mention good trees and bad trees are the Greek words agathos and sapros, which literally mean healthy and unhealthy or unwholesome trees. Now here is the clincher. Remember in Luke chapter 13, in the parable of the owner and the gardener, the gardener suggests giving the unhealthy and unfruitful tree another chance with probably extra burrowing and extra digging of trenches around it to allow a good yield. That is Yeshua's response to such teachers. Remember, if we cast the stone at such wrong teachers because of their misgivings, we too will be under dire scrutiny. In fact, the very person who is responsible for the act of protest against the set Catholic monarchy himself was led to inaccurate doctrines over his lifetime and thereby dangerously came up with wrong teachings against the Jews. This person was Martin Luther. God is gracious to those with inaccurate or inconsistent doctrines. That is, God is perfectly capable of turning them back to the truth. But false prophets are a different league of their own and are not to be trifled with. And they ought to be recognized instantly as members not of the flock of God and to be avoided and aware of. Now, interestingly, when we look in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, there are three groups of animals mentioned. The sheep, the goat, and the wolves. Now, we instantly know that wolves are the false prophets and they are not of the flock of God. But what about sheep and goats? Sheep and goats are very similar. Nevertheless, they are entirely different. When we look at their biology, they differ by six chromosomes. That is, sheep have six chromosomes lesser than goats. Now, it might not be an interesting factoid, but to consider the difference in the number of chromosomes between two similarly looking animals or animals which have similar functions or feed the same way or probably taste the same way, that is an interesting concept. Yet, goats are often representatives of the Gentiles and sheep often of the flock of God or the chosen ones of God. It was an interesting thought that occurred to me that probably when we all get saved, that we initially were goats. And when we get saved, we lose the number six, which is the number of man. That, that I thought that was an interesting similarity. And we know that goats were often used as scapegoats, as vessels of sin. But sheep were always offered up as offerings, as burnt offerings unto the Lord. So my theory is that we probably start out as goats. And then when we come to the word, when we come to the king, when we come to the Messiah, he makes us his sheep. And our roles transform. Our goal, our goal goes from providing meat to providing wool, to providing clothing, which is the business of God, which is to cover up or to clothe his people, his children. I thought that was an interesting similarity. All right, people, let's get to our discussion boards. Thank you so much for your time.